The islands of the Galapagos are famous for their unusual forms of wildlife, like the only seagoing lizards in the world, the marine iguanas. What is often overlooked is their importance to birds, especially to seabirds. The islands are an ocean nursery. Many of the seabirds of Galapagos are endemic species or subspecies that nest nowhere else in the world. The Galapagos, which lie on the equator, have two main seasons, with several months of transition between the cool and the hot weather. From January to June, it's very hot with some heavy rainfall. Then there's an overcast, humid, cool season known as the Garua, though its onset and duration are unpredictable. The Garua is the result of the arrival of cold water from the south. The seas cool down by only a few degrees, but it's enough to produce grey and dismal weather. In different ways, the ocean governs the nesting behaviour of most of the Galapagos birds, and certainly all the seabirds. The Galapagos lie in a part of the Pacific where the ocean currents are very complex. From July to December, the southeast trade winds drive the cold Peru current with its rich seabed upwellings northward. This cold water stream then turns west to join the south equatorial current and provides the Galapagos with comparatively chilly, food-rich waters. When the southeast trades slacken around November, a mass of warm water flows south and west, bringing rain and decreasing the amount of seafood available around the islands. When an extra powerful current known as El Nino persists, disaster can follow for Galapagos marine life, including seabirds. Sea conditions can vary from island to island. From July to October, the east flowing Cromwell undercurrent brings some of the richest and coolest water to the most westerly islands. These variations in food supply and sea temperatures greatly influence when seabirds nest. The same species often differs in choice of breeding time from island to island. Blue-footed boobies fish close inshore. This feeding frenzy off the island of Española indicates that the boobies will probably be nesting there. On the more northerly islands, it's quite possible that the same species isn't breeding yet, if the sea conditions aren't right. In other parts of the tropical seas, the brown pelican's nesting period is seasonal. The Galapagos subspecies breeds at all times of the year, whenever the sea surface is rich with fish. A common noddy perched on its head scavenges fish scraps left by a pelican. Like almost all Galapagos seabirds, the pelican is an opportunist feeder and breeder. It builds a stick nest overlooking the ocean and lays two or three eggs. There are only a few Galapagos seabirds with a fixed breeding cycle. Each year, the waved albatrosses start to display in April as part of the pair formation for breeding the following year, and not as a prelude to mating. Almost the entire population of waved albatrosses, some 12,000 pairs, nest in just one place, the island of Española. 
the waved feather pattern gives the albatross its name. There are several reasons why the albatross has a more regular nesting schedule. It arrives on Española in early April. It needs a lot of time to mate and rear its single chick. By arriving in April, it avoids the three hottest months of the year. The timing also ensures that its chick hatches when food is likely to be most plentiful. The waved albatross ranges over vast areas of ocean to find food for its young. So the albatross is far less dependent upon the vagaries of the local currents. But it's by no means immune to them, and some years breeding fails completely. Waved albatrosses mate for life and courtship is an intricate process. The pairs that arrive on Española have either bred together previously or formed their bond in the courtship period the year before. A green patch relieves the stark black lava flows of the island of Fernandina. Vegetation is rare on the shorelines of the Galapagos. These are mangroves and they provide a nursery for the brown pelicans. Mangroves thrive in salt or brackish water. Red mangroves colonize the tide edge and their stilt roots provide a buffer, preventing erosion of the coast. Their seeds are dispersed by the ocean currents. They're very tenacious and can even survive on apparently inhospitable volcanic shores. Throughout their range in the Galapagos, brown pelicans find mangroves ideal nesting sites. Inshore feeders, like pelicans, find it easier to locate food and expend less energy in catching it. In Galapagos, they generally breed more frequently than the pelagic species, which have to range far and wide in search of food. Galapagos pelicans lay two or three eggs and often rear them all. But many immature birds die because they have difficulty learning the technique of diving to catch fish. Pelicans are not immune to the disaster of a persistent El Nino year either, when the surge of warm water from the north takes away the food fish. The mangroves also provide a nursery for some of the land and shore birds. This yellow warbler is catching insects to take to its young in a mangrove bush. It removes a dropping from the nest. The marine environment influences the warbler's breeding behavior. Insects are most plentiful during the hot and rainy season. Nesting in the mangroves nearby, the yellow-crowned night heron feeds on crabs, centipedes and beetles. Because it catches insects for its young, it's less affected by the weather and the seas around the islands. This nest originally held three chicks. The weakest has been pushed out by its siblings and is dead. Siblicide, as it's called, ensures that only the strongest survive and are fed when food is short. The remaining two chicks are evenly matched in size and strength, but are still in competition with each other. As their name suggests, night herons are mainly nocturnal hunters. When the parent returns that night, only one chick is in the nest, but the second one soon re-emerges from the mangroves nearby.
In most cases, two chicks do survive and are successfully reared. This nesting colony is on the slopes of the collapsed volcano Ecuador, at the northern end of the largest island, Isabella. Punta Vicente Roca is the site of one of the big blue-footed booby colonies. The birds have chosen their nesting site well. When the Cromwell current is flowing strongly, the seas off Isabella are full of fish. A male blue-footed booby flashes his bright blue feet as he lands. It's part of the display to attract a mate. In large colonies, there's almost continuous breeding, and pairs may nest every seven to nine months. But even here on Isabella, breeding success can be unpredictable. A male sky points to a female. It seems they both use the display of blue feet to assess the value of a potential mate. During courtship, symbolic nest building takes place, but taking a twig from a nearby nest provokes territorial aggression. So does landing too close to another bird's nest site. Another island and a different area of the ocean nursery. Genovesa lies to the northeast of the archipelago. Its low scrub provides one of the main nesting areas for the great frigate bird. The male frigate's display is as unusual as the blue-footed boobies. It inflates its deep red throat pouch to attract passing females flying overhead. He perches in a bush and shakes his wings, displaying his swollen gula sac to attract maximum attention. When the male succeeds in attracting a mate, he goes into a frenzy. Raising a chick takes so long that frigates in the Galapagos breed less than once a year, and often only once every two years. They're largely dependent upon the ocean currents for food, picking fish from the surface of the sea. Like the other seabirds of the Galapagos, the flightless cormorant only breeds when the seas around its nesting islands bring abundant food within easy access. There are fewer than a thousand nesting pairs in the world, and most are found around the Bolivar Channel between the islands of Isabella and Fernandina. The cormorants raise their young between March and December, with a peak period from April to June. That's when the cold Cromwell current carries most of the food on which the cormorants feed their young. Cormorants feed their chicks on partly digested fish, eels and octopus. Most pairs rear a brood of one or two chicks a year. They're excellent swimmers, but their wings are useless for flight. For the first 70 days, 
both parents bring food or sit on the nest. Then the female leaves to find a second mate, and the male rears the chicks alone. This is unusual, since most seabirds mate for life. Even if a female doesn't lay again that season, she's ready to breed the next time. This wouldn't happen if she continued to raise her first brood, so it's a successful breeding strategy for a species unique to Galapagos. The juvenile birds are beginning to catch fish for themselves, although the parent still feeds them. The young cormorant begs for its food in the water, but the adult doesn't part with the fish so readily. The flightless cormorant has only been closely studied quite recently. This large, conspicuous and unusual bird was only discovered in 1896. At Punta Vicente Roca, the blue-footed boobies have successfully nested and reared young. This means the fish they dive for has remained plentiful and close inshore. There are three species of booby in the Galapagos, and each has a different feeding range, so they don't compete with each other. Like most of the seabirds that fish close to shore, the boobies lay two or three eggs and sometimes rear more than one chick. Galapagos hawks and the non-poisonous Galapagos snake are the main predators here. The snake is too small to harm the booby chicks and the adult birds appear more curious than defensive about its presence. The wave albatrosses of Española arrived in April, laid most of their eggs in April and May, and hatched their chicks in late June and early July. These downy chicks will eventually grow into birds with a two-metre wingspan. This chick is being fed on regurgitated fish oil, which the parent manufactures in a specially adapted part of the stomach while spending long periods away feeding at sea. Another pelagic or far-ranging ocean bird nests on Española the red-billed tropic bird also nests on some of the other islands, wherever it can find a suitable sea cliff. The tropic bird, like the boobies, is a plunge diver, often dropping from 15 meters to catch fish and squid. It can't walk well on land and flies far away from the islands to make its catches. The tropic bird lacks the albatross's method of turning food into an oily substance and storing it. 
so it has to return frequently to feed its young. The tropic birds nest throughout the year on the islands of South Plaza and Daphne, with regular peaks of nesting. The limiting factor seems to be the availability of suitable nesting sites. Tropic birds lay a single, very large egg. The chick is brooded for at least 50 days, but once it's fledged, it leaves the nest for good to feed for itself and is completely independent. The tropic bird is not unique to the Galapagos, it's found throughout these latitudes, but it's one of the most striking and beautiful seabirds here. The season for rearing chicks in this unique ocean nursery never comes to an end. Somewhere within the 13 main islands and 110 smaller islets, some species will be found nesting throughout the year. There is one breeding cycle that has a predictable beginning and end, the waved albatrosses of Española. These large chicks have well-developed flight feathers, which they'll soon be exercising. The waved plumage has now almost completely replaced the early down covering. It's about 230 days since this young bird's parents mated and a single egg was laid. The waved albatrosses reared on Española this year won't return to breed for at least three years. During that time, they'll feed and travel long distances over the ocean. The powerful and changing currents of the sea affect everything which takes place in the seabird colonies the ocean nursery of the Galapagos.